literally everyone can be a scientist. So you're currently a postdoc right now, um, studying cancer, and you are also a co-creator of a comic, I don't know, empire, like a, you're <laughs> publishing, you do comics, you know, um, so can you just explain how it is that you came to be both a scientist and a comic book artist slash publishing director? Yes, absolutely. So um, I've probably always loved drawing for as long as I can remember. You know, I grew up watching the Rugrats and I'd have sketchbooks where I would draw Tommy Pickles and his friends on little adventures and print out all of my favorite animes that I would watch so Sailor Moon and everything was really big in the you know late 90s as that was uh coming in and I, I was just constantly drawing um so much that I actually thought that I would originally go to college for art but all of that effectively changed when I had my high school chemistry class um with Mr. Richard Coy he is utterly amazing. I'm actually still in contact with him now, like 15 plus years later. Um, but it was just because he made science so much fun. And he was, is a chemistry teacher and also a musician. So he had a band um, when I was in high school and like they had an album like that I got and I would listen to. And he was probably without even realizing it, my example of not having to choose between two different passions. Uh, towards the end of high school, I had learned about what viruses were. Mm -hmm. And I thought that they were so cool because they were walking this fine line of what was considered to be alive or dead. Mm -hmm. And just the idea that we had no idea what they were, like with regards to being alive or not, was just completely fascinating to me. So. I wanted to study viruses. So I, I went and I majored in biology. I minored in chemistry um, and also uh, linguistics and an almost complete minor in Japanese. So basically wow. staying well-rounded was always kind of my thing. Um, and then from there, I went to grad school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I was in the cancer biology program um, but actually in a virus lab. So I worked in the lab of Dr. Nate Shear, where we studied HIV, which does not cause cancer. So but it's some viruses do. But other viruses do, exactly. You know, as you go further in your education, you're getting more and more specialized. So I started with a love of just all things science, and then I went and majored in biology um, so I chose to focus on that and then now I'm in grad school and I'm focusing even more to know the inner workings of how HIV works. And I kind of started to miss some of that curiosity that I had. Serendipitously, one day just having lunch with some friends, one of my friends, uh, she was trying to finish up some experiments before having lunch and she was running around and trying to find um, one of the reagents that she needed um, that's called a, a phosphatase, but she mispronounced it a little bit and the word phosphatase came out instead. Uh -huh. um, and the group of us like kind of paused after she said that and then started making a whole bunch of jokes about how phosphatase could be like the alternative name of, of someone that's like a superhero and they're <laughs> trying to regulate the city. Um, okay. You know, instantly my mind thought back to like all of the cartoons I used to watch as a kid. And I just got really struck with this idea of, no, science and comics could be a really fun way to explain the really confusing things that are going on in our body. Mm -hmm. So all of us, um, me, Kelly, and also Kwa, the third co-founder, do not have an art background. We were all trained strictly as scientists. So we, taught ourselves how to draw, how to use um, these computer softwares to draw digitally or to convert whatever we draw on paper into something digital so we can share it farther and have just been learning as we go. Um, so can you tell me about the Building Steam anthology? We originally got some funding from the art business competition at Wisconsin. We proposed a project that would bring 
scientists from around the campus doing all different kinds of scientists, all different career stages, um, just all different backgrounds in every way diverse um, and pair them with us. So JKX Comics as well as local artists to create comic books about their research. So we made a total of seven different individual comics uh, that I have printed here that um, is for each of the different science scientists and what they do um, at UW. All incredibly different, um, but collectively that's about 200 pages worth of comics across all seven. And so what we're doing is we're combining them all into a physical book. Um, so the money that we earned or won in that competition covered all of the printing for that, the posters, running the workshops. And then uh, we put all of the comics on our website for free, but we wanted to do more. So the Kickstarter now is allowing us to have the printed copies of this. So we always want things to be accessible, which is why you can read all of these stories now for free. But to have um, printed copies would allow us to donate to places, schools, after school programs, wherever um, that might need, be in need of um, learning material. So in addition to rewarding anyone that would want a physical copy of this book through the Kickstarter, we're also donating to the Madison Reading Project, which is a local nonprofit in Madison, Wisconsin that actually works to increase science literacy in kids, specifically underserved communities um, in the Madison area, so. Uh, I totally love what you're doing. I mean, I just, gosh, I wish, like, what if every university had this science outreach day and had scientists working with artists? I mean, I just, yes, I, I, love, I love what you're doing and I just wish that like it was happening more. <laughs> Tell me about your trading cards. Yes, um, okay, so other than the comics, I, love making trading cards just because I love showing who the people are that do science. So it's pretty obvious that I do not look anything like Albert Einstein, right? I might have large hair, but it is neither white nor am I like a male that's like being held up in a dark lab yelling Eureka to myself. So I really like, and it's, that's also why I like comics is that it gives the opportunity of showing who these people are that science isn't done in a vacuum alone. It's not magic, even though it often feels that way. It's like, no, there were people behind the scenes working incredibly hard to make this happen. And so through comics and also through trading cards, it's a way to sort of start to tell those stories um, and the trading cards in particular started when I was working um, on an online initiative called Unique Scientists, where we were just highlighting scientists just to show that everyone is unique. And it doesn't matter what your story is, you are unique and you belong in science. And I, I really identified with that. Um, so now just kind of in conjunction with, with making the comics, I'm trying to find ways and projects that I can take the portraits that I enjoy making and turning them into trading cards as part of that project to be like, here, now you can have a little snippet of what this person does both as a scientist, but also personally, and just know that these are humans that are doing really, really cool things. And yeah. also just know the breadth of jobs there are inside or types of science there are. Yeah, right, yeah, that's awesome. Like we've been talking so much about your art and your like comic trajectory, which I love and is amazing, but you are also a research scientist. So yes. can you actually, so can you, can you explain what a postdoc is? Yes. And then can you explain what your research is? And then, and then we'll come back okay. and you can tell me how you balance them. Okay. Um, so I am a postdoc at the Fox Chase Cancer Center. And what that means is that I have earned my PhD. So postdoc is actually a shortening for postdoctoral. I got my PhD in cancer biology, working in HIV, as I said before, and then now I'm specializing. So I'm either learning new techniques, learning a different science that I can hone in on for um, what I want to do for my future, which is to run my own lab. So what I'm doing now 
even though my degree is in cancer biology, now I'm actually a cancer biologist studying pancreatic cancer, um, and specifically it's tumor microenvironments. So not the cells that make the tumor itself, but the cells that are neighboring and surrounding it that give it support. And an analogy that I really like to use is like a seed in soil. So if you imagine the tumor to be the seed, what soil it's in will determine how it grows. So if you have very dry and arid soil, that seed will not grow, it won't germinate. And that's kind of like what the environment is like when we're healthy. However, if you have a really rich and fertile soil, that's going to give all of the nutrients and support for that seed to grow into a glorious cancer plant. Um, and that's what's happening in our bodies if it's in an environment where cancer can grow. The, the surrounding area of that cell is providing support to the tumors so that it can get everything that it needs to keep growing uncontrollably, which is really bad for us, but very good for the cancer. So I'm trying to figure out how one particular cell type in that environment called cancer-associated fibroblasts, they're, they're really kind of at the heart of everything in that microenvironment. So I'm trying to understand how those cells in particular are communicating to each other in order to create such a supportive environment for the tumor. So would one approach be to get rid of them? Like if you could get rid of them, would that be a way to help kill a, a, a tumor? So that is a fantastic question and it's very complicated. So that is exactly what people thought to do. Unfortunately, if you do that, the cancer somehow grows more aggressively. So there is a natural tumor restricting property to these cells as well. So it's almost like they're being mind controlled by the cancer once it's there to help give them support. Huh. So it's what we're trying to do in my lab is try and figure out how we can convert them back to their natural state of uh -huh. being tumor restrictive as opposed to get rid of them. So uh -huh. just kind of go going back in time to when they knew that these cells should not be growing, these cells should not be here, how do we stop it versus let's give them all of the support. I see. So are you getting close to finishing? I have no idea. So that's that's the fun thing um, about this job. So both grad school and the postdoc is kind of an open-ended question um, because it's really based on the science and inquiry. So the, the main thing that these jobs run on or like the currency of this job are publications. So being able to figure out something for science and to tell us a whole complete story of what's happening and something meaningful. So not just- And what you're gonna tell is gonna be a primary literature paper. Yes, yes, exactly. So that takes many years to accomplish. Um, when you're in it, you don't know when that end is because science can also be a little bit unforgiving in that you think you're on the right track and then you get a piece of data that doesn't fit with how you thought things were working and then now you're you're it's like you're you have a puzzle in front of you but you don't know what the complete picture is so like someone just gives you all of these puzzle pieces and say put this puzzle together but you don't know what the image is you don't know how they're supposed to fit and getting a new piece of data is like oh hey i found this extra puzzle piece on the floor we knocked it off the table but i don't know where this fits <laughs> I thought it was a cat, but now it looks like a unicorn. Exactly. It, like, it has wings or something, yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to that question about balancing. Like, how do you balance being a comic book artist extraordinaire with being a postdoc? Um, it's a little bit of doing things when I get home. Um, so I'm trying to get better at work-life balance in that I will not work when I'm home. So less about the connection with my partner because the convenience is that he also makes comics. So we both just can do that together, but then making sure that we have time that's not comic work and not science work that we can just like watch TV or play video games or like hang out with our pet bunnies. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say we're the best at it, but it's definitely 
getting better and and kind of like a do science during the day, make comics at night kind of thing. Okay, okay. You say on your website that you also like to do things with yarn. What yes. What do you do with yarn? So I, I love, cro I know how to both crochet and knit. Um, I just love doing those things for a while. Th those were my commuting projects. So when I caught the train into lab, I would always have a skein of yarn and crochet hooks in my bag so I could just sit and make something. Um, so like baby blankets, hats. Um, I made, uh, I crocheted a dress for wow. myself. Wow. I, I wore to my friend's wedding. Um, really I also cool. have, for knitting, I made a DNA um, cable sweater vest. So like the middle panel is like the- Oh my the gosh. <laughs> Wow. I've recently picked up tapestry yeah. weaving. That's my yarn thing. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've been weaving some textiles for around the house, but tapestry yeah. weaving is my new. So I, I have never thought of myself as a fiber artist. And here we are. Yeah. You can, <laughs> you can learn lots of things just given time. 